Rosemary, your fully charged live event is happening this weekend. So when you listen to this podcast, it'll it'll have been over. But uh, that's a big event event in Australia, isn't it? Yeah, I'm excited. It's the first one uh, this year, but they've already locked in for next year as well. So I guess that the response was good. So I'm looking forward to seeing how many people show up and yeah, and checking out all the all the stuff that they've got there that you can do like electric car test drives and um, other ele- electric stuff like uh, electric lawn mowers and scooters and, <laughs> and other fun stuff like that. So it should be should be a really good weekend. Well, uh, speaking as an electric lawnmower owner battery power lawnmower owner they are fantastic so i i encourage everyone in australia to buy a battery powered lawnmower it is the it is the most awesome thing because you don't have to mess with the gas change the oil none of it you, you charge it you run it it's brilliant <laughs> this week we have a, a number of stories um about nature uh wind turbines um uh, have been a problem for birds or at least thought to be a problem for birds, but a number of studies on offshore wind indicate that the birds avoid the wind turbines, which is great. And another study has popped out in regards to painting wind turbine blades and towers sort of black and white and and almost a checkerboard pattern uh, to help keep birds away. And it, it may work, but Rosemary has deep concern about the structural impacts to the blades. Yep, and we're going to talk about um, wind turbine blade recycling. If it makes sense to require that this uh, that this happens, technologies are available to do it. Should we just do it? We're going to talk about some of the trade offs that you might not think of. Um, it's not not really the slam dunk that it sounds like. Then we have Phil Tataro from Intostore back to talk about BP's plan to reset its renewable business and focus on offshore wind and green hydrogen. And our wind farm of the week is Bloom Wind in southwest Kansas, so stay tuned for that. I'm Alan Hall, president of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, and I'm here with our Australian blade guru, Rosemary Barnes. And this is the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. There has been a number of news articles in the press over the last couple of months uh, looking at birds flying into offshore wind turbines, and there and there's been a number of research efforts to look into that. Uh, one of the research efforts was led by Vattenfall, and it looked at wind turbines uh, offshore of Scotland in the North Sea, and for two years they studied seabird behavior uh, at the Aberdeen offshore wind farm. Uh, tracking these birds to make sure uh, we kept track if any of them hit hit turbines, right? So they looked at a couple of different birds, uh, herring gulls, gannets, kittiwakes, and great black-backed gulls. So birds you typically see on the seashore. Um, and they, they watched them from April to October when they had the most activity. They did not record a single collision between a bird and a wind turbine blade. Zero. In fact, they found that seabirds uh, deliberately avoided the wind turbine blades uh, of these offshore turbines. So <laughs> uh, there's, there's some people who ran this, this project, uh, one of them, Henrik Scove, says, uh, quote, people have claimed that, is, uh, that very costly solutions would be needed to ensure birds avoid collision with the wind turbine blades, but the species they've tracked do a great job avoiding them. They seem highly capable capable of surviving in a wind power environment. Uh, so for these particular breeds of birds, they, they seem fine around wind turbines. Like they can see them, they can sense them, they're not going to fly around them. Uh, but that's not the case worldwide, right? I mean, we, we know that birds run into wind turbines. That seems to be common knowledge, particularly onshore. We know that. So... It, is it just because these birds are a little bit smarter, maybe a little more streetwise, that they're not running into wind turbines? Oh, I think that overall birds are not hitting wind turbines at any sort of, you know, huge rate. Um, I think if you're going to talk about wind turbines and birds in general, it's not a big problem. Um, you know, buildings, cats and cars are, you know, thousands of times worse for birds Um 
as you know human caused problems for birds than um wind turbines are and you've also got to remember that climate change is uh, becoming a problem for plenty of bird species as well and will be more in the future um and balance all that but the issue is that while that's true globally it's not true for every single kind of bird um so you kind of really can't talk about birds in general this is a solution that stops birds in general from getting hit by wind turbines I think you really have to take it species by species and wind farm by wind farm. There are some large bird species that are already endangered, not due to wind turbines, due to other mostly man-made reasons. Um, and then, you know, even if you've got a really, really endangered bird species, then even a couple of extra deaths from wind turbines is becomes a big deal. It's really good to see the news that these gulls and whatever other bird species they were looking at in this study, they're, they're able to see the wind turbines and avoid them but i'll be surprised if it really silences any critics because it's beside the point for what people are upset about which is specific endangered bird populations being hurt by specific wind farms kind of a mystery right we just don't know a lot about it but at least somebody's doing studies which is what needs to be done and then there's there's more news in this front because there's there's uh, a couple of efforts have been uh, done on some wind farms where they paint the blades black and white and the towers too, evidently. So they <laughs> everything it's got this kind of massive black and white color, uh, which is unique, I thought. I mean, why are they just don't paint them red or orange or something that's highly visible? Uh, and there's good reason for that, actually. Uh, so the, there's a recent study about painting wind turbines black and white. Uh, and the, the rationale is, is that birds, the way they have to see if the eyes are on the side of their heads, they really don't see that well straight ahead, right? And those big birds of prey, like we were talking about vultures and eagles and things like that, uh, are constantly flying at high altitude, looking down for little mice or fish or whatever they're going to go eat. So their the kind of vision is located down, and they're not looking sort of side to side. So the the thought is that uh, these birds, these bigger birds, which have just a different vision system than like a seagull does evidently uh they they notice these these change in shades um it's like if someone's approaching you from behind you kind of see their shadow it's sort of like that evidently uh, and but it, that looks to be very effective now my question is if it, it is effective then great when we can paint the wind turbines black and white but i i thought that we don't like painting composites black for a, a, a structural reason, right? Doesn't it make the blades hotter, warmer? Yeah, it, it can. And that's a, one of the reasons why you wouldn't just, you, you know, um, paint one of the wind turbine blades black just in case it helps. Um, yeah, because they can heat up and wind turbine blades, the materials that they're made for, made from, they get softer and um, less stiff as they heat up. So that's definitely a, a problem. But um, the... The thing with the thing with that that study about painting one blade black, uh, so it was the original study was done ages ago, but just really really tiny and um yeah it was not obvious whether it would be you know whether it was a real result yeah so the, the latest study hasn't really gone too much further than that um it's still very small but i hear it all the time oh all you need to do is paint one blade black and then birds don't die so why aren't they doing it wind turbine designers just hate birds or something is the conclusion but the reality is it hasn't been rolled out widely and i can't really understand why it, it wouldn't be it's not it's not so hard. I mean, it's painting one blade out of a, um, a rotor black. It's not as easy as it sounds because you are going to add some some mass and you also have issues where, you know, each wind turbine um, rotor, it's its blades are balanced. You don't you can't just put pick any three random blades and put them in in a set because they have a weight variation. Um, the manufacturing tolerance is is bigger than what you can actually have on any one rotor. You couldn't have two heavy blades and one light one. It would be uh, um, imbalanced. And so at the factory, they don't know which three blades, you know, they don't they don't know when they're making them which blades are going to make which set. Um, they wait until they're made and weighed and then they will pick 
pick them, like arrange them in sets that are balanced, right? So by the time that you've done that, you might end up, oh, this this rotor has three black blades. This one has, you know, two, um, yeah, two black blades or, or whatever. It's not not so straightforward. So you'd probably end up having to paint them afterwards, which is uh, extra work, would slightly affect the aerodynamics, would slightly affect the weight, all those things. So it's not totally trivial, as trivial as it sounds to, you know, someone who's maybe not involved in the industry. But it just clearly hasn't been proved, it hasn't been demonstrated to actually work. The study says that it does work and they're giving reasons why it should work, right? I, I, I don't know if it's going to be implemented everywhere, right? I think that's the big step is, all right, so let's, just, let's just assume that if I paint uh, part of the blade black, all of the blade black, and, and put it out in the service, that it's going to reduce. So just say it re- reduces bird deaths by 10%, right? Which is probably enough to do something with. I, I wouldn't assume that. I, 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 I can't say that's like a conservative thing. I, I reckon it's probably incredibly close to zero for um, the majority of projects. Otherwise, I do feel like it would be rolled out by now. Why? Why it's such such an easy solution to a problem that um, it's not a big problem, the bird deaths, but it is a problem that people talk about a lot. Well, it, the thing that I worry about the most is, like you said, if you, when you paint part of a blade black or one blade completely black, it, it, the flexibility is going to change, right? So you don't have a weight imbalance; you have this flexibility imbalance. And we were talking with uh, we were at the American Clean Power last week. And ran into uh, Lars Benson from AC883 up in Canada, and those, and those guys do pitch alignment. And they were describing how bad of a problem pitch alignment is on bearings and gearboxes and all of that. Uh, it seems like having a blade a little more flexible that maybe has a little more load, less load in some instances, would put stresses on the gearbox, all the bearings, and basically age your turbine. I would, that would be my big concern wouldn't it be yours yeah definitely and also on the on the tower you know if you've got um one one blade bending a lot more than the other then you're going to get some you know funny funny loads um ha- happening some you know maybe exciting the natural frequency of the the tower in a way that wasn't um expected but rotor imbalance is a huge huge problem and you know every turbine has a sensor for um or it has some sort of a way to determine when there's a, a rotor imbalance and they, they shut down because Otherwise, you end up shaking your turbine apart, and that's how you end up with collapsed um, wind turbines. Oh, you do. It, you, know, you can if they get way out of balance. I think one of the things that uh, Lars was just describing to me was it may not move the tower all that much, but it's definitely putting bearings in jeopardy. So it may, it may not knock down your turbine, <laughs> but it will shorten its lifetime. And yeah, that's why I wonder if everybody's a little cautious about this technique because the OEMs haven't really blessed it yet. Right? If uh, Vestas comes out and says, hey, we've done a study, we put all the, the strain gazes on a, a couple of turbines, it's not going to affect anything, everybody. Go ahead and do it. And I, then I think that you will see lawmakers probably recommend, that, not that I think that's a great idea, but I, I do see it being implemented in certain parts of at least the United States. Well, I think that the one blade black thing um, is definitely a high risk, um, you know, idea to, 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 to roll out and you wouldn't do it without compelling evidence. And then I think you'd only be putting it in places where you expected there to be a problem with birds or where you were surprised to find that there was a problem with birds because uh, I mean, at least in Australia, and I'm sure worldwide, they are doing bird studies um, when they're planning a, a site for a new wind farm. Um, so, you know, they are generally not putting them where they think that there are going to be big problems with birds, um, especially if there's, you know, endangered birds um, that are going to be significantly affected. Um, they will they will experience some extra bird deaths from a wind farm being there, definitely. But, um, you know, like I was saying at the start, it's not to the scale of, you know, you put a new road in somewhere, you're going to see a lot more extra um, bird deaths from that than you would from the wind farm. And, in fact, one of the studies that I read about it, um, they studied all the bird deaths from the wind industry and found that the number one cause of bird deaths in the wind industry was um, employees driving to and from the wind farm, hitting them in their car. Even the employees hitting them in their cars is a bigger was a bigger effect in this particular study than birds hitting um, wind turbines in the wind farm. So, 
you've got to keep it in perspective. And if there's a real risk of um, causing problems for the wind turbines and ultimately it'll be a safety problem in the end, um, you're not going to say on the off chance that this saves a, a bird, um, we're going to put out some unknown risk across our whole fleet of wind turbines. I mean, that's just not a smart a smart thing to do. Sounds so easy, just paint one third of your wind turbines black and then birds won't die anymore. But one, the evidence is not there that it's going to save significant numbers of birds. Um, and two, it's not as easy as it sounds. All right. You heard it from the, the beak of rosemary, who is our resident ornithologist. Is that how you pronounce it? Ornithologist? <laughs> That's a big word for a, a kid from Nebraska. So <laughs> more to come. There's more to come on this. I, I, I think I think if they can make it work, it's great because it's probably the cheapest solution to help reduce bird deaths. But the stripey idea is one I hadn't heard about before, but I wasn't. And I, I will admit that I didn't spend hours researching this before the show. Um but have they actually done it or is it just somebody that's an expert in bird vision that's saying, I expect this would work? Where, where's this stripy wind turbine? Well, how, how many have they tried? You can't just like, you know, try one one wind turbine and, and think that you've got now globally applicable results. Uh, you need at least tens of them, you know, in different locations um, and, you know, more before you'd really be sure. But the stripy thing, at least you're going to avoid most of the problems that we're talking about with having one blade um, black and the other two white. No, I, I think it's the same problem. But it depends how, I guess, how much area you need black. I guess you need quite a lot of them to be black. Yeah, you might end up with stress concentrations as well because you've got like a really um, – flexible part of the blade and then it's and then it's stiff and then it's flexible and then it's stiff so yeah that's what i'm saying right <laughs> it, it's it's a complicated problem it's a complicated problem without any mechanical composites uh effort analysis behind it yet somebody I needs to get down with a couple of pencils and erasers and sketch out <laughs> how this goes wrong because this is not going to go away if, if they if the ornithologists can get something to work in the field and it looks promising, you know uh, regulators can be knocking on the OEM stores asking them to try it. Yeah, but I think people need to remember as well that it's not a case of we just let birds die in the meantime until we solve this. Like They are taking this into account when they're citing wind farms and where there are problems, they de get declined. And and there are definitely contentious wind farms. There's a couple in Australia, or one, one especially um, on the north coast of Tasmania at the moment that, um, that you know, it's been, it's been approved, it's in, environmental um, assessment was, you know, accepted. Um, but a lot of green groups think that it's going to be terrible for birds. So I'm not saying that in every case there's agreement um, and you never put a wind farm in where it would damage a bird, but there is at least a process and people are already <laughs> trying to avoid this problem by, um, yeah, not putting wind farms where endangered birds are going to be hit. And there's other methods too, like, you know, they've um, you got some um, vision systems looking out for endangered birds and shutting them down in some places and uh, all, all sorts of stuff. Well, that, that's a trade-off, right? You can either turn the turbine off which is going to be one solution or slow it down, which is a solution implemented right now or leave them running at full speed with some black and white blades. I'm not sure which is the more expensive of the options. It may be equal by the time you're done. Get the latest on wind industry news, business and technology sent straight to you every week. Sign up for the uptime tech newsletter at weatherguardwind.com slash news. Well, there's uh, numerous efforts across the United States at the moment to prevent the burial of uh, aged out wind turbine blades. So as we retire wind turbine blades, they need to go somewhere. Uh, historically, they have been cut up and, and buried in landfills uh, because they are considered to be essentially construction waste and inert. And so that's the method that's been happening. But a lot of states are starting to push back. Uh, because it just, the photographs look bad. Uh, that's, that's just some total of what I can understand it. It just doesn't look good. So this bill in Washington state, and it, it passed the Senate up there, uh, aims to, quote, hold green energy to green standards and would require Washington State University, University to examine the feasibility of recycling wind turbine blades. 
Uh, the, the bill's sponsor, Jeff Wilson, said he was concerned about creating waste, burdening landfills, and the importance of stewardship of wind turbine blades during the disposal process. Quote, what are we going to do with the thousands of used wind turbine blades when they reach the end of their life cycle? Simply burying these giants in our landfills is not acceptable, given our commitment to the environment. This bill provides the opportunity to explore the potential to manufacture and recycle these components right here in Washington, expanding job creation in the green energy sector. So wind power is the second largest energy source in Washington state, uh, producing about 3.4 gigawatts. Pretty good amount. Uh, this, this Washington state effort is being copied all over the United States currently. Uh, the, the one thing about these efforts, Rosemary, which I always find odd, is they want to connect the local university into finding out if they can recycle blades. You can recycle blades today, if you wish. There are plenty of opportunities to do that. Am, am I off? Yes and no. <laughs> you you can you can recycle. Um, there are there are ways if you if you wish if you wish to pay the the bill for it. Um, and yeah, it's not economically um, sensible at the moment. You know, like there's no argument if you've got some aluminium waste or some steel waste, you're definitely going to recycle them because you will get you'll get more money from that than you would from having it sending it to landfill and for wind turbine blades that's definitely not the case um partly because the product that you get out the end is very low value um and another part of the problem is it's very expensive to recycle them because of the logistics of it you know they're huge big blades um and they're very distributed so when you know a wind farm comes offline are you going to go and move a you know some processing factory on site to deal with them and then the next wind farm in another different state um goes offline so you just relocate your factory because you know obviously once the the blades have been um, recycled you don't need it anymore the new wind farm comes in and you know in 30 years time you'll want to recycle those blades you're not going to leave a factory sitting around <laughs> until then um, or you can chop them up and chuck them around. Um, but the, there's heaps of environmental trade-offs with it. So I think that it's a bit disingenuous that you would say we can't send wind turbine blades to landfill because of the environment. Because actually, if you have enough space for landfill and it's managed properly, which I assume in the US they are, uh, then... It, it's just going to sit there inert. It's not. It's not harming the environment um, when it's just sitting in landfill. Whereas recycling, there's definitely environmental harms associated with it. First, in terms of transporting them, you know, thousands of kilometers to the recycling facility, that's going to be a problem. But then, second, some recycling processes, especially for plastics, can actually. Um, you know, consume more energy, release more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than if you just made virgin every time. So it's like, what environmental issue are you actually trying to solve by um, recycling these blades? And I think that <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. I can't remember if you said it while we were recording or beforehand, but that the real problem is that there's photos of blades in, in landfill and people don't like how that looks. That's that's the real problem. Well, in the cowboy state, which is Wyoming, uh, there's an article in a publication there talking about the amount of wind turbine waste that's going to happen over by 2050. So the, uh, according to an old study in 2017, um, they're predicting 43 million tons of blade waste annually by 2050. Uh, and they give a comparison that's equivalent to the weight of 215,000 locomotives. Now, I, I don't have no idea how much a locomotive weighs, so it's not a good unit of measure. <laughs> so I can't tell you why they chose a locomotive for this. But okay, that seems like it's pretty heavy. And, and Europe and the United States are obviously going to account for about 40% of that waste, China being the other 60 percent is probably uh this article goes on in very interesting ways to describe that blades are not toxic all right they're, they're they are uh considered to be uh, construction material in fact they they contacted the waste supervisor in the city of casper wyoming actually a great town uh who said uh, the landfill isn't taking blades there right now. I'm not sure why they're writing this article, but they also say that they don't have any le leaching potential. There's really nothing inside of them. And uh, they're not put in lined pits where they put uh, 
some other solid waste. They're treated like construction or demolition waste. So if you knock down a house, knock down a building, where those materials get buried is the same place where they would bury wind turbine blades. So they don't consider them to be toxic at all. In fact, they, they talked to um, the, the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality, and they said, hey, we treat them like construction material. <laughs> that does, unless they contain asbestos, which they don't, uh, they can just be permitted like other debris. So uh, although there may be the concern about the, the, the quantity, the weight, maybe, I'm not sure why the earth cares about the weight of, you know, the landfill wouldn't care about the, the weight of the wind turbine. Um, as much as maybe the volume, right? It seems like a better number. It, it's not a, it is not a, a big environmental deal. In fact, it has no environmental impact on just burying the blades. And as you said, it could be the least environmentally, uh, um, least the most environmental way to dispose of of those blades instead of chopping up and shipping them somewhere. And then you've got to compare to, I mean, it sounds really big, that number, and it is a projection 25 years in the future. So um, let's let's see. Also, the, those blades that are going to be recycled in 2050 are probably only, you know, they'll be made in the next few years probably. It'll be 500 meters long. <laughs> I did a quick a quick search on the um, EPA um, and found that in 2018 there was already 292.4 million tons of um, municipal solid waste in the US. So I, I don't know what that growth rate is, how much that would be in 2050, but there is a lot. There's a lot more waste than you would you would think. It sounds scary to say something in in tons, but it's a lot smaller than the current waste problem that we've all got and ignore and you know don't change our consumption habits in in the slightest you know way to try and reduce it at all for the for the most part. So keep it in perspective. Yeah, and anytime you try to predict twenty five years out, roughly, you you just can't. It assumes that nothing changes between now and 2050 and all kinds of we'll, uh, things will change between now and then we'll have people walk around on the surface of Mars in 2050, the way things are going. So are we going to really worry about uh, recycling a wind turbine blades in 2050? I doubt it because we'll have it figured out. Things change. All the major manufacturers are working on this, on this problem. Um, so uh, they, they have solutions. Um, they're not, economic yet. So I think it would take a bit more public outrage or a bit more, um, you know, advancement in the, the science before, um, well, the technology before we see that rolled out, that needs to be some sort of push other than the, you know, the fact of it being technically possible because it, you know, it already is. Um, but you, you gotta, you gotta prioritize this, you know, you can't do anything in engineering without, um, you know, realizing what the, the trade-offs are. And the fact is if we, okay, so we've got this technology that's available. Um, and if we said to tomorrow, you have to recycle every single wind turbine blade that you retire and every new wind turbine blade has to be easily recyclable, it would make things more expensive, divert workforce away from, you know, other other important problems like rolling out wind farms as fast as possible to, um, you know, to offset fossil fuels. So it's not, you know, it sounds really nice to say, okay, well, let's make um, wind energy environmentally perfectly responsible with not, you know, any tiny problem. But by doing that, you're just maintaining the status quo longer. And it's it's really urgent that, you know, that we get wind farms in the ground and um, get fossil fuel generation reducing. So um, I think that it, 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 people, environmental activists do need to see the big picture. It's not enough to just focus on a, a small issue and um, demand no more wind turbine blades and landfill you have to understand where the effort and money to solve that problem is going to come from. Right. Uh, Next Era Energy uh, was asked about this concern because they have a couple of wind farms out there. And Mike Mazur uh, from Next Era Energy uh, responded because they have Cedar Springs and Roundhouse Wind Farms. Uh, he said that almost all the components in their wind turbines are recyclable true. There's a lot of metal. It's in it's recyclable, the copper, the steel. Uh, when the de- wind turbines are decommissioned, uh, they work with the turbine manufacturers to break apart the components and recycle the pieces. And then they also donate parts and pieces to wind turbine training programs across the country, which is true. So the, the, you, you know the wind turbine operators are actually trying to recycle as much as they can. It makes total financial sense to do that. 
uh, particularly for metal components. And they just got to figure out what to do with the blades. And I think that answer is coming faster than 2050. It's probably a 2025. Uh, we've, we've transitioned to a, a long-term solution. Lightning is an act of God, but lightning damage is not. Actually, it's very predictable and very preventable. Strike Tape is a lightning protection system upgrade for wind turbines made by WeatherGuard. It dramatically improves the effectiveness of the factory LPS so you can stop worrying about lightning damage. Visit weatherguardwind.com to learn more, read a case study, and schedule a call today. Well, we have Phil Totaro here from Intel's store. Welcome back to the program, Phil. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. I always save the toughest financial business questions for you. So <laughs> BP was trying to cut its oil and gas uh, business down and start bringing up its renewables. Well, it's not slowing the gas and oil business down as much, and it's not accelerating the renewables as much. And they have been re reviewing their solar and onshore wind business and thinking maybe they need to slow those down also. And the, the, the goal here is it looks like they're going to move to um, a more offshore-based company, offshore wind-based company, and as part of that, get into the hydrogen business. So they see the hydrogen as being uh, a big draw over the next several years. And their, their uh, green chief, Anja Isabel Dotsenrath, has made a, a couple of really interesting statements here. Uh, quote, we made some changes internally and focused, created a focused hydrogen organization, a focused offshore wind organization. Uh, and sh there, she's just starting to renew, uh, review the onshore renewables portion of the business. So uh, it looks like BP is, is headed towards green hydrogen. And that doesn't make a lot of sense based on what other uh, renewable companies are doing. Is this is this because BP is uh, coming out of oil and gas and the players with the, their competitors they see or sort of the Exxons of the world that they they need to stay into the liquid fuel, hydrogen based fuel, carbon based fuel game? Well, it's a, it's an interesting uh, topic because I think based on the amount of hype that hydrogen has right now uh, everybody at least wants to you know claim that they're either getting into it they are in it um, they're developing a project they want to develop a project um, you know it's it's I guess trendy you could say to uh, be involved with with hydrogen at this point even if their ultimate ambition is uh, just to capitalize on the momentum of the hype train for, for hydrogen at the moment um, now, with that said, uh, I would think an oil and gas company is better positioned than most to be able to pivot from oil and gas to hydrogen. Um, they, you know, BP in particular has several projects that they're working on in Europe where um, there's going to be offshore wind linked to uh, some type of an electrolyzer, uh, either offshore or near shore. Um, and it's going to produce, you know, either green hydrogen, you know, ammonia or some other type of, uh, you know, chemical um, that they would or gas that they would be able to use um, for. Well, it's it's interesting because you can there are plenty of different potential uses for it. There's transportation fuels. There's, you know, the potential for storage. Uh, there's blending of hydrogen with natural gas, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of interesting things that could be done. Now, the question right now is, are any of them actually economically viable? And the answer is not really. Um, the, the reason for that is that, one, you haven't really hit you know, significant economies of scale with a lot of that technology yet. The other one is demand. And while everybody and their uncle says that they're doing green hydrogen now, the question is, are we really going to, you know, instead of utilizing some type of synthetic drop-in fuel to replace petroleum-based, um, you know, uh, gasoline, are we really going to use hydrogen or a hydrogen blend for, for transportation? To be perfectly honest, probably not. 
it's more expensive to do that versus some type of synthetic. Um, you know, so then the question is, okay, industrial uses of hydrogen. Um, is there really enough demand to warrant, you know, how many, you know, gigawatts worth of wind energy are going to be powering hydrogen electrolyzers if, you know, everybody's, you know, proposed project actually comes to fruition? Not, the, the answer is also no. Um, so we're, we're kind of in this um, weird space, I guess, at the moment where there's a significant amount of interest in uh, in hydrogen, again, presumably because of the, the hype train and the momentum that they've, they've built. Um, the question is, is there really a significant enough amount of offtake for it? to warrant everybody doing a hydrogen project everywhere in the world. I don't see it happening. So are they thinking they're going to take a large piece of the pie then, Phil? Is, is, is that the, is that the game? Is they're going to try to get it early enough that they're just going to control that market? Again, that's a great point because for all the companies that are talking about doing it, first and foremost, if you need to develop any new technology, you need to cost reduce it. You Again, you need to get to, a point where there are economies of scale, et cetera, et cetera. So a well-capitalized company that already has experience in offshore um, and now offshore wind and then, you know, uh, hydrogen production, presumably the oil and gas companies in general and BP in particular will be better positioned than most to be able to capitalize on this. Um, so I think the answer to your question is yes. Getting in early will put them in kind of pole position, if you will, um, but again, I don't, I, I just don't see, you know, enough demand yet for hydrogen to be, you know, like everybody is talking about, you know, hydrogen in Australia, hydrogen in Brazil, hydrogen in the U S Canada, you know, all throughout Europe, we don't have enough industrial demand or consumer demand or, um, you know, any other uses for that much hydrogen at this point. So I don't see how this is, how you're really going to, you know, get to significant economies of scale, even with these big companies um, like a BP talking about investing. So it, it's still a, a bit of a challenge. Well, that sort, certainly points to BP remaining in oil and gas in the long term. If the hydrogen market's not going to pick up. They can always rely on oil and gas for the next 20, 30 years for sure. And it's going to hedge their bets. And then if they add hydrogen, then that's just a bonus because you, you would think that the markups in that marketplace are much higher than onshore wind or onshore solar. It's an industry that goes up and down so much that there's, as, as we know, there's billions of dollars in profit in it right now. Exactly. And, and the reality is, especially precipitated by the geopolitical situation, um, we, you know, the Europeans are all talking about this great energy crisis next winter that they're trying to gear up for now. Um, so as long as oil prices are going to remain high and there's profits to be made, it's going to necessarily slow down any kind of energy transition. Um, that begs the question as to whether or not this whole hydrogen thing is is just, you know, I, I hate to use the term greenwash, but I mean, because, you know, BP, to their credit, is is serious about, you know, and again, they're, they're best positioned as an oil and gas company to actually do, um, you know, to become a serious player in, in the hydrogen space. Um, but it's just how big is the hydrogen space really going to be? Uh, so there's, there's, a uh, commercial challenges, the technical challenges aren't really that big of a deal. You know, there's, uh, th this type of chemistry has been around for like 200 years, you know, at this point, it's just making a more efficient electrolyzer or, you know, different conversion technologies. Um, but you know, it's just the, the, the business case and the commercial case for, for that much hydrogen is, is a bit of a head scratcher at this point. Yeah, well, I think this does make sense in, in terms of uh, searching for higher margin businesses because uh, BP has been having conversations sort of off the record with Equinor 
uh, for the last several weeks trying to get more involved in some other joint projects where the BP uh, staff wants to be more involved and try to understand. It sounds like they want to understand more of what's happening on these offshore wind projects uh, to train staff, to expand that business. Who, who's the best to learn from? Equinor is probably one of the better companies to learn from. So it, it, that would make sense to me. They want to kind of get into those joint projects and, and get their people in and learn something if they're going to be focused on offshore wind where the margins are higher, the PPAs are higher. That, that sort of fits the mold, doesn't it? Exactly. And and with Equinor's experience, especially with floating uh, offshore, they, you know, I think it, it makes sense. Obviously, uh, Equinor and BP are also partnered on several development projects throughout the rest of the world, not just in, in Europe. Uh, and so it, I think it's going to make a lot of sense for them to continue, um, continue seeing that relationship flourish, but also uh, it's it's interesting because you, you brought up something before about BP, you know, potentially, you know, refocusing their, their business strategy and, and even exiting things like onshore wind. The reason to bring Equinor in as more of a development partner is also because of Equinor's deep pockets as well. You know, let's share the pain of all these inflation induced increases in, um, you know, in, in the cost of capital and, and the, the, you know, project uh, expenses at this point. So, you know, it, it makes sense for BP to to want to be able to facilitate that. Well, Phil, this is why we have you on the program, because you can, you can clarify some of these really complicated decisions that are being made at uh, oil and gas companies and renewable energy companies. There is so much activity, it is hard to keep track of. So everybody, uh, you can connect with Phil Totaro at intelstore.com or reach out to him on LinkedIn. He's always there he, and he has great content on his LinkedIn on profile. So thanks, Phil, for being on the program. Thanks, Dale. Our wind farm of the week is Bloomwind in southwest Kansas. And Bloomwind is owned by Capital Power and it went online in 2017. It's a, it's a wind farm just south of Dodge City, Kansas. Uh, they have 54 Vestas V117 3.3 megawatt machines. They have an permanent employee on site and four contractor companies, including Vestas, which must be doing all the maintenance on those wind turbines. They pay a little over $700,000 in property tax each year for that wind site. Uh, if you're not familiar with Dodge City, Kansas, and if you haven't watched any uh, cowboy movies from the 1950s, Dodge City was a real rough and tumble place for a long time. It is called the Queen of the Cow Towns. Texas Longhorn cattle were driven to Kansas where they could be offloaded onto rail cars. And uh, there was a thing at the time where there was a tick on the Texas Longhorns that would infect other cattle. So the state of Kansas kept pushing the Texas Longhorns uh, path up north from Texas further and further west, and they ended up in Dodge City. So Dodge City became a boom town. Uh, during the, the 1880s, and it grew tremendously, and it is infamous for gunfighters. And at one time, um, they had probably the largest number of gunfights <laughs> anywhere in the country. Uh, it also boasts a whole bunch of saloons and gambling halls, brothels, and all, all kinds of crazy things. Um, and at one point in the late 1880s, they even had a bullfighting ring <laughs> where bullfighters were put on shows uh, with uh, longhorn bulls. So it's kind of a rough and tumble place that has transitioned over time, and now it's uh, it's into the renewable energy business. So congratulations to Bloomwind in southwest Kansas. You are our wind farm of the week. That's going to do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thanks for listening. Please give us a five-star rating on your podcast platform and subscribe in the show notes below to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter. And check out Rosemary's YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie. And we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast.